Okay, so in talking about a central Christian doctrine and minimalist approaches, now we're going to move from a salvific minimalism to a systemic minimalism. And here, you want to think about Venn diagramming, where you might have some overlap in the system. In this case, you'd have a Venn diagram where you have really concentric circles. So you'd have like, what are those minimum doctrines to be saved? And that would be well, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is God's appointed one. Jesus died, rose again from the dead, and faith in that provision is what's going to save you. Well, there's the first circle of systemic uh, minimalism or salvific minimalism. But then around that, you're going to have another set of doctrines added to that that are going to minimally define Christianity as a complete distinct religion as distinguished from Islam, from Judaism, from other things. For example, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a necessity to articulate that there's one God who exists as three persons in some minimal way to be saved and to understand that in any meaningful way. Now, I'll talk about this in a minute, but, but what happens if someone comes along and appears to believe the minimal stuff and now saying Trinitarianism is false or Christ is not God? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the point is, systemically, there are certain doctrines that do define Christianity as Christian, like the doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity is unique to Christianity. Uh, Judaism, Islam, Deists, and others simply have one-person monotheism. Three-person monotheism is necessary for identifying Christianity as Christian. And as I've noted in uh, some of the other videos, it also... Trinitarianism is the basis for everything we do. For example, we think about what it means to be in the image of God. Uh, ontological image, how we as beings are similar to God, that'll be similar in a Unitarian and a Trinitarian system as far as our abilities. But as far as our intended functions, see, remember what we are supposed to do as God's creatures and made in His image is to imitate Him as best as possible as our God. And so for the, for the Unitarian, got to remember, because God is the perfect being in monotheism, so for a Unitarian God, what is the perfect state of existing? And that is to be by yourself, all alone, thinking important thoughts. Okay? So to imitate that God, you are not going to emphasize loving relationships as much. You're going to emphasize independence and being a smart person. Whereas in Trinitarianism, yes, we emphasize being an intelligent person. Again, iron sharpens iron, and we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. But to be functionally in the image of God in Christianity is, by this all men will know you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and thus you fulfilled the whole law. See, this is all grounded in Trinitarianism and in trying to imitate the intertrinitarian love relationship. So that's why even though the Trinity it doesn't seem to be expressly stated uh, for, as a need to know for salvation, it is definitely a defining doctrine that points to all of these other things that you need to know for salvation. So we start with you've got to add Trinitarianism to that. Uh, explicitly, for example, the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15 says, Paul says, if Christ is not risen, our faith is empty, we're still in our sins. Paul himself makes the bodily resurrection of Christ an essential Christian doctrine. Now, what's significant is that that thief on the cross didn't have to trust or believe in Christ's resurrection because Christ hadn't even died yet, okay? So think about this, because we're, uh, as we're, we're videotaping these lectures, uh, Resurrection Sunday, a.k.a. Easter, is coming up. And you've got to remember, too, that people doing their preaching about resurrections, you've got to remember, you, you'll, you'll hear a lot about resurrection power and the power of the resurrection and this, that, and the other thing. Or in apologetics, you know, you'll hear, well, resurrection from the dead somehow is proof that Christ is God so that everything he says is true. But Paul actually connects the resurrection to salvation itself. And the question is, Why? It's actually very simple when we think about it it's because we just start with the basics. What are the wages of sin? Death. That's right. Because arguably human beings were supposed to be immortal. Death is a penalty for sin. So as the substitute 
who is going to fully satisfy our sin debt so we're not going to be in a state of death. Here's the point. If Christ as our substitute is still dead, God is still punishing the substitute and the debt is not paid in full. Okay? That's why it's so significant that when Christ rises from the dead, the demonstration is, is that God is satisfied fully with the payment that Christ made. And now free forgiveness can be extended to the human race and offered to the human race because satisfaction for sin has been fully made. And the fact that Christ is no longer being punished by being dead, he comes back to life and shows that he's satisfied the, the debt that we owe to God. So that's why it's so significant that the bodily resurrection of Christ, because it's a proof that atonement is complete. Okay? and that there's a basis for free forgiveness now from God. So God can be just and the justifier. He satisfied the justice of God by bearing it himself, and now he can, he can declare people or impute forensic justification to others as a free gift. So that is why we need the bodily resurrection of Christ. So as we start to think about these, you're going to flesh out a list that we have in here of about 10 to 12 doctrines uh, that are literally just, you know, what are these things? Well, where do all these doctrines come from? From the inspiration and authority and inerrancy of Scripture. You don't get these essential doctrines anywhere else but the Bible. So you've got to start there. That's where we get the Trinity, the full deity and humanity of Christ. We need a God-man to save us. Otherwise, you can't have God as the God-man paying the price for sins. Uh, what also do we need? Monotheism, creation out of nothing. We need to acknowledge that so we, we can acknowledge the fact that we're turning to God. Uh, we acknowledge that we're made in the image of God, that we're accountable, that we fell into sin. We acknowledge our guilt, alienation, corruption, and our state of eternal death. Then we acknowledge the substitutionary satisfaction of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ. Uh, then salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ, which is what the Bible tells us. That is what distinguishes Christianity from every other philosophy and world religion as a system. So with that, we're going to see too that there are going to be doctrines that are logically connected with these essential doctrines, but we'll get to some of those later. So think about how is the virgin birth or the virgin conception connected with, say, the sinlessness or the incarnation of Christ? Uh, when you talk about the incarnation or the resurrection, what do you have to have in place for that? The doctrine of miracles. You can't deny miracles and then affirm the bodily res resurrection of Christ. So there are going to be some doctrines that are logically connected with this, but also to note, and I'll cover this as we get to those doctrines, that theologians and apologists deal with some issues quite differently. See, for example, a Christian apologist is going to ask a question of whether, how to prove miracles actually occurred, okay, like the bodily resurrection or other miracles. See, so the, the apologist goes extensively into the proof that miracles actually occur and God does them. We, as in biblical studies and theology, we just assume it because the Bible says that God did a miracle. But we ask the question, why God does the miracle? What's the importance of the resurrection of Christ, not whether or not it actually happened? So those two have to go together to do effective preaching and teaching. So those are the first level or essential Christian doctrines, which, as I've mentioned, for most of you, if you're in an independent fundamental evangelical church, you probably have about 10 or 12 of these, the ones I rattled off here on the page. The problem, though, is that your, the way you operate your church is a lot of the doctrines you rely on are mostly tradition because they're not in your doctrinal statement. And then you open yourself up to schismatic movements in your church and disagreements and all sorts of things. If you don't really think about those secondary level doctrines that don't affect Christianity or the identity of a Christian, but really do affect the well-functioning and harmony of a local body, of Christians or living the Christian life in sanctification. Now, so those secondary doctrines, I'll give you a couple examples of these and show why you really need to think about these and take positions on them. 
Some of them are obvious, like church government. Okay? Uh, you can't, the same local church can't be an Episcopalian and a congregational church at the same time and in the same sense. Okay? Uh, this is not an argument that one is right or one is wrong. But the fact is, you can't say there's one bishop appointing pastors and elders, uh, and that's the proper mode for the church, and then a bunch of people saying, no, we need to call congregational meetings and have individual members vote for pastors and elders. Okay? Those are just in conflict. You can't run the same local church with those conflicting modes. Uh, others, like uh, Calvinism versus Arminianism, uh, in reality, yeah, those are secondary issues when we think about the sovereignty of God, human ability, uh, and so forth. But it will affect your philosophy of ministry and the differences. So, uh, again, if you, if you are a Calvinist, you believe in total inability and uh, the, as far as the uh, limited atonement or particular redemption and that God is only regenerating the elect who will then turn around and have faith, and this is done primarily through the means of the word, you're going to emphasize more preaching and theology and a little less on apologetics coming first. If you're an Arminian, you believe in original sin, but universal prevenient grace takes care of that inability. You're going to assume people have ability to do, so you're going to put a little bit more emphasis on the persuadability of people to be argued into the truth of Christianity. That will affect your philosophy of ministry and how you run a local church. So it does matter. Even if you haven't thought about it, it matters. Because most churches have taken positions on these things, even if you haven't formally done it. And it's affecting the way you're doing your ministry. What I have uh, argued for, though, is that you really think about these and formalize it because when that when that division in your church happens, it causes a lot of pain and suffering and interrupts the ministry work you're doing in the church. So it's better to think about that now. Uh, same thing with uh, mode of baptism. Again, you've got credo Baptist, you know, it's full immersion and believer only. Okay. Uh, again, then you've got why? Because, you know, <laughs> because supposedly that's the way the Bible says it. Uh, you've got uh, those churches that also teach it's okay to baptize infants. And again, why? Because uh, some of these churches would teach something like uh, because it replaces circumcision as marking the person as uh, I, the child as a member of the covenant community. Okay? Uh, this isn't saving them, but it, it's uh, in a replacement theology. It's going to replace circumcision and mark the infant as a member of the covenant community. All of those have some significant spiritual significance for living the Christian life. So again, or as uh, some still say, you know, dunk, sprinkle, pour, or dry clean, right? Uh, there are some denominations like the Salvation Army, Quakers and others that don't, uh, they're non-sacramental churches. They don't baptize and do communion. So again, if you think you ought to baptize, don't go to your Quaker church and start a ruckus there. Uh, if you're not baptizing, you know, again, don't go in and create a controversy in the local church and cause division unnecessarily. Uh, communion. If you're independent, non-denominational, my, 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 my intuition and guess here is you're having communion once a month and you think it's a memorial service. And so that and you think about remembering Christ about once a month. Uh, other Protestant churches, like most Presbyterian and Lutheran churches, they tend to see it more as a sacrament, that it's a means of, of grace to help the saints persevere, and you're going to do it weekly, along with the preaching of law and gospel and other things like that. So in either case, again, those, those two ideas uh, about uh, communion aren't going to go in the same church at the same time, if you have different ideas about it. A um, couple of the more important things, like uh, tongues and sign gifts, and this is a pretty significant one because most of the church splits that I've consulted on had to do with charismatic versus non-charismatic issues. And, and the four or five churches I've dealt with went something like this. The church was planted as a sort of mostly cessationist, non-charismatic, non-Pentecostal church. The founding pastor was a good, essential preacher and teacher. Twenty years later, they get their second pastor in or maybe their third pastor in. And because you did not have this functional cessationism as part of the church doctrinal statement, 
They didn't really bother to ask the new pastor about it. Well, now what you've got is the pastor now takes the office and starts teaching. Now I want all of you to seek words of wisdom, or I want you to seek words of knowledge, or uh, look, I want you all to seek speaking in tongues. And then people say, well, we don't do that here. Now you've got a split. You've got a faction in the body of Christ. Now, why is that significant? Here's why. This is not a non-issue. Because if the gifts, sign gifts, have ceased, and someone stands up, starts speaking in tongues in the middle of your congregation, how are you going to interpret that? And if cessationism is true, whatever that message is, it's not from God. It's either some psychological problem, selfishness, or demonic. So you're going to treat it differently. If, it, if tongues and sign gifts are still around and God is giving specific words of knowledge or words of wisdom, and you're a cessationist, you're going to be seen as quenching God's revelatory ministry for this present day and age. So this is not a non-issue, and it's not something that you can get along with at the same church at the same time, because both are pretty important ways of understanding what's going on uh, with that ministry. Same thing with complementarianism and egalitarianism. Um, complementarianism is the idea that there's male headship, pastors and elders who are in the teaching aspects uh, and in control of doctrine, that should be done by qualified males. And that you, don't, you do not have females who are called or qualified or gifted to take place in that. Egalitarianism says that God calls both certain men and women to be able to go into those eldership or, uh, or pastoral positions. Now, why is that significant? Here's why. Again, not in the same church, not at the same time. If you're a complementarian, male headship, what would you believe about trying to call a woman pastor or elder to be in control of doctrine? There are no women who are called and gifted to be in that position. And if you put an un ungifted and unqualified person in the position of leading a church, they're going to ruin the church. So that is a very significant issue. It's not just you're against women or you're a misogynist. If, you if that is true, you want to make sure that we have the best, most qualified people who are always the ones running the church. If egalitarianism is true, then what you're doing are preventing some very gifted and well-qualified people from doing good ministry. You could have people doing more help in the church and having more qualified people rather than less. So this is not a non-issue. And which, by the way, um, is very important because I, I do public discussions and debates a lot. And uh, there's been two or three occasions where I've given a public lecture on, say, the occult and witchcraft. And I've had someone who, I mean, two or three occasions, a woman come up afterwards or during the question and answer period and say, you know, I, I grew up in the Baptist church and I left the Baptist church because they didn't allow women pastors and there was no place for female leadership. There was nothing in the church for me, okay? And I said, well, you know, I mean, that's, there are egalitarian churches out there, but I told her, I said, Here, here's your thing. If, say, if you can't be the leader, there's nothing in the church for you. You get a church of a thousand people and you've got five pastors, you know, and five elders, you know, you've got basically 1% of the church that only, there's only something for them in the church and the other 99%, there's nothing for them because they're not called to be the leader. And they kind of look at me and go, what? You say, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Guess what? The other 99% of the men aren't the leader either because they're not called or gifted to be there. So you want to raise the egalitarian issue. You got to remember, it's not, you got to remember, it's not that all men are qualified to do this in complementarianism. It's only certain men that would be qualified and gifted to fulfill that role. Because I'll tell you, you see a lot of really bad men who think they're called to ministry and they're not. They're not called, they're not gifted, they don't study, and they're not good pastors, okay? And that's, complementarianism may still be true, but you got the wrong man who's not qualified for the job. So again, as you think through these things, the real issue is, is not just it's men and women, it's we want the most qualified, called by God and gifted people to be running our churches so that we can have efficient and effective ministry. So that's why when we look at these secondary issues, uh, like means of sanctification, growth in the Christian life, the fact is we're called to be holy, 
And if, if you're stuck in your sin, guess what? You know, and you're having problems in your life, problems with relationships, problems with quenching the spirit, guilt, you know, things like that. Guess what? You're probably not doing it right. You're not living a good, mature, robust Christian life. That may not affect your salvation, but it'll sure influence your effectiveness and happiness in this life. So don't, especially if you're in apologetics, say, well, that's a secondary issue. It doesn't matter. No, it does matter. It, it, it may not matter for salvation, but it's certainly going to matter for sanctification and living the Christian life. So I, I encourage you to put an emphasis on that. Finally, in, the, in a minute left here, third level doctrine is stuff you can disagree on probably in the local church and still get along. So for example, what's the best way to cast out a demon? Okay, You can probably have a really good, robust discussion on that in the local church. Or give you a case in point, someone comes levitating into your church, head spinning around, spewing out green stuff, speaking backwards in Latin. And then the five pastors get together, huddle. All right, what's the best way to get rid of a demon? Hmm, hmm, okay, whoever casts out the demon wins. Your, your theory was right. Okay, That's a third level kind of thing. You could probably have a debate on and that because it's on a practical issue, you can have a discussion here. Now, there are some ways where you could go out of a third level to a secondary level, but we'll address that at some other time. Anyway, thank you, and I'll see you next time.